um, and to begin our very special event here in the Smith School of Business. Can you hear me okay at the back? Great, good. So to begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, and we're grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We are very privileged and very honored to welcome the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Professor Yemi Oshinbajo to Queen's University. Welcome. <laughs> Joining the Vice President, we're also very honored to welcome His Excellency High Commissioner, Mr. Ashokun. Welcome. <laughs> Both the Vice President and the High Commissioner, uh, we have delegations um, joining us as well who've, who've participated in the first meeting of the day and are now here as well. We're also joined in addition to the people in this building to another room in the law faculty. So I welcome you to the others in the law faculty and to the many um, participants who are joining us on the Zoom call. Welcome to you all. Just to outline very briefly, we'll spend the next hour, roughly an hour, and you'll hear very briefly from our partners in the Nigeria Canada Trade Investment Group and from the office of the vice president as well as from the High Commissioner, um, uh, the High Commissioner Ashikan, um, will be speaking to us very briefly. And then the main event will be Vice President Oshibajo, who will speak to us for about 30 minutes or so. And we really would like to have some time for questions um, from the audience. So why are we here today? Today's visit is in part a celebration of a very important partnership that stems from the work of a member of our own alumni community, as well as a manifestation of our university's ambition for global impact. And it's really Hakeem Speer who graduated from the Master of Innovation and Entrepreneurship program here at Smith actually, where we're meeting today, who established an organization named One Million Teachers. And you'll hear from Hakeem um, very shortly. But briefly, One Million, One Million Teachers' mission, working in partnership with the Queen's Faculty of Education, is to take on SDG 4, quality education, and SDG 5, gender equality, by building a critical mass of change makers who will become leaders in their communities. And I'm going to leave it to you, Hakeem, to describe that program in greater detail just for the sake of time. So thank you. So this is not the only collaboration between Queens and Nigeria that is working to meet the ambitious 2030 sustainable development goals. And those of you um, who know the university will know how central that 2030 agenda is to the principal strategic framework and to all that we do here at the university. The Jim Leach MasterCard Foundation Fellowship run by the Dun & Deshpande Queens Innovation Center here at Queens works in partnership with recent graduates in Nigeria and across Africa to bring their entrepreneurial ideas, which address local problems to life. And in fact, 20, 215 Nigerian participants took part in the 2022 uh, uh, fellowship program, and that's the most from any other single country. In last year's pitch competition, Lotana, which is a Nigerian-based startup, won $5,000 in a final pitch competition for a climate action-related project. So it speaks to the subject of today's uh, lecture. So this program is made possible through the generous funding of the MasterCard Foundation, whose contributions to Queen's University total over $50 million dollars with $1 million earmarked for the Jim Leach Fellowship. I was recently in um, Kigali for uh, the MasterCard Foundation Baobab Summit, and I heard from several of the student recipients of the Jim Leach uh, Fellowship about the impact of that fellowship and really enabling them to build the skills and the confidence to be leaders of change. 
So our meetings today with the Vice President, High Commission, and all the teams that are here with us today have really focused on how we can come together to continue to enhance collaborations and the deep and mutually bi-directional partnership between our communities. So I'd invite you now to spend two minutes watching some highlights from the Muna Taro exhibition that was held earlier this year um, at Queen's in June. So cue to the video. I'd like to introduce um, now Abby Ashukun, Communications Director for the Nigerian Canada Trade Investment Group, to tell us a bit about, more about Munotaro. Over to you, Abby. Thank you, Sandra. Good afternoon, Your Excellency, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, Your Excellency Adeyinka Ashukun, invited guests students, faculty, and members of the Kingston community. It is with the utmost privilege and pleasure that I am here today, representing actually two organizations, the Nigeria Canada Trade and Investment Group, which helps facilitate trade and um, investment opportunities between Nigeria and Canada across various sectors, including education, as well as 1MT Cares, which is the not-for-profit arm of the 1 Million Teachers Organization. Our mission is to ensure that all teachers, no matter the social economic position or geography, have lifetime access, free lifetime access to the One Million Teachers Training Program. On December 24, 2000, almost 20 years, 22 years ago, I landed in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in negative 20, 20 degrees Celsius. <laughs> And you can imagine for someone coming from Africa, that was extremely cold. I woke up on the 25th of December, Christmas day in my dorm room and I looked out the window and it was just pure white snow. I called my dad and I asked him, 
why did you bring me here? <laughs> what did I do wrong? <laughs> but 22 years later, I stand here before you because of the opportunity Canada gave to me. The opportunity to be me, to be my own person, to be this young Nigerian girl who dared to dream, to be better than her parents, to achieve a master's degree, and to be someone that her daughter, because I'm a mother now, can look up to. With all that has happened in the collaboration between Nigeria and Canada, with our organization, the Nigeria Canada Trade and Investment Group, I got to connect with Hakim Subair, CEO of One Million Teachers in 2019. And we've been tied at the hip since then. We've worked together, we've cried together, we've slaved together, but we're here today to celebrate all the achievements that we've made and opportunities to still come. Because of the coming together, we got organizations such as Girl Rising involved, which is an organization that supports um, the education uh, for girls. We got Five Cowries involved too as well, which is an organization that supports arts education. We got Queens involved too as well because of the collaboration between Queens and One Million Teachers. We got the, the Northeast Children's Trust involved uh, because of their support in ensuring that children in, in displaced communities have access to right education. We got St. Lawrence College involved because of their vocational programs and opportunities that they saw could benefit children um, in Nigeria and Africa and beyond. In June 2022, we all came together, and that's what Munataro means, we are coming together. We came together to share one voice, and the voice is that education is important. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, you deserve the right to education. From June in Kingston, we went to New York in September of 2022, where we participated at the United Nations um, Transforming Education Summit. And for, for me, this was the first in my family that you would have a young Nigerian girl participate and be on a panel at the United Nations. Again, Canada gave me that opportunity and so did Nigeria. With that collaboration, we met with UNESCO and we have a representative here today, Lily. And now Queens University, one million teachers, one empty cares, the Northeast Children's Trust and UNESCO are collaborating together to come together to put together an application for the Global Affairs um, application on gender equity and STEM for girls. And we are also looking at supporting the UNESCO's Transforming <coughs> Education um, uh, Program with their youth-led in initiative. And so with this, we thank you so much for being here. We thank Queens University, St. Lawrence College, one million teachers for all the hard work and dedication that you have provided to all of us to ensure that we are here today. And before we bring up Hakeem and Dr. Miriam Masha from the Northeast Children's Trust, I would like for you all to see um, just a few clips from the leadership from all these organizations on what they thought about Munataro this year. Thank you. is part of the Munitaro collaboration uh, and it's an example to me of something that needs to happen a lot more um, especially in the nonprofit world people work in all kinds of different silos and this is an example of organizations coming together collaborating each bringing their own respective skill set to tackle really big problems uh, educating girls and ensuring their ability to stay in school uh, and learn and have equal rights is something that needs more and more of us to work together uh, to be able to change that reality. It just shows what can happen when people get together to work for the greater good of all. I think um, a lot of what we've seen in the past has been about people having vested interests or working in silos a lot of the time inadvertently but sometimes even deliberately. And I think it's very important for us to work together because everybody has something to offer. And we must put all hands on deck. 
because of the challenges that exist in so many spheres in our countries. You know, so in, in Nigeria in particular, it cannot be just, uh, we can't be clinical about education al uh, alone. There are a lot of issues. There's poverty, there's um, the health of the mother, the quality of teaching, the safety and security issues. We must find a way of um, bringing out projects that actually are very robust and very comprehensive. And because we have experts in many fields, you know, nobody really is expert in everything. We must encourage each other, you know, to come together and work together, you know, so that we're able to make the impact. The numbers are just too huge and the challenge is too dire, too sheer. I think it's um, collaboration, uh, coming together and leaning on each other, learning our ways to solutions, partnerships. Those are the things that came out to me. Just what's so powerful about this organization is the coming together of three organizations to really advance a new understanding and a new imagination of the way that girls and women can build sustainable, more equitable societies. And what I really love about this concept is recognizing that change requires collaboration, it requires coming together, because some of the challenges facing our world today are too big for us to um, you know, isolate and, and pursue in an individual way. We need active individuals who are impassioned and we grow these individuals and girls through this initiative, but we also need that coming together and that collaboration. Our mission as a, as a college and as a system is about access to education. Uh, and that's what I, you know, that's why I love this initiative because it's truly at its core, at its heart, it's about access to education. And we all know that uh, uh, education is the great equalizer. And so for me uh, in our college, um, making sure that uh, access uh, to education, whether, you know, whether you're from uh, Canada or from across the world, is uh, one of our most important um, priorities that for us as an institution. What a taro is incredibly important. Coming together is what it's all about, which is what Munataro means. And we in, in the Faculty of Education, act, our mission is about uh, creating a place where people can come together to learn, grow, and help build inclusive communities for teaching and learning and research. And I see Munataro is doing the same thing bringing people together, people who care, people who have the best interests of their country at heart, who want to provide for children the kind of education that will prepare them for a bright and incredibly important future, especially in countries where there has been conflict and difficulty. One of the things we talk about a lot here at Smith is the, the importance of having social impact in business for good. And for me, what we're talking about is the importance of education for gender equity and equality, in addition to solving a critical issue that exists in the world today. And Munatara is a great example of how we can leverage the knowledge and experiences that are gained at immense high quality institutions like Queens, but that ripples out like water to a very key global impact and it's a way for us to recognize that one person can have a tremendous impact on the globe and we can make a tremendous difference to begin to attack and address some of the real key global issues we have today. The biggest takeaway for me is uh, the fact that a lot of people are really, really passionate and want uh, an opportunity to be connected to great causes. And uh, sometimes we're afraid to, uh, you know, do something because we are afraid of uh, failure, uh, but today it's a reinforcement of the fact that uh, when we really, really feel passionate about something, we should go out boldly and uh, just go out there and don't try to shrink uh, because you're thinking that, oh, this might not succeed. There are so many lessons learned and uh, we are going to use this opportunity to uh, reach out to some of our other partners who, didn't, who were not as active in this uh, as we wanted. Uh, but because of what they saw today, uh, I think they're willing to step up uh, their commitment 
Uh, we want to be able to leverage uh, what has happened today uh, to garner more support, to get more people to advocate for us uh, for other similar programs. But beyond the collective of Munataro, I think each of the individual organizations are uh, actually doing good, meaningful work. Hopefully, uh, what has happened today will shine a light on those individual organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite up Hakim Suber, CEO of One Million Teachers. Dr. Mariam Masha, CEO of the Northeast Children's Trust. Good afternoon, everyone. His Excellency. The Vice President of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimajo, Your Excellency, the High Commissioner of Nigeria to Canada, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a bit emotional today, actually very emotional. Um, so this is where it began for one million teachers, uh, right here at Smith, uh, from the master's program the Center for Social Impact. The first seed money that we got to kickstart one million teachers came from this university. And um, thank you. and uh, the first office space we got for close to a year came from this institution also. So we got a lot of support. I have some of my coaches in the audience. Um, who just saw what we were trying to do and saw that we really needed help and they came forward. Uh, and I think one of the big uh, things that happened uh, just after was uh, when the Faculty of Education came on board and said, we are gonna give you an army. I, I don't think I understood the impact of that statement when it was said by Professor Chen until about four years after. And here we are today. Uh, so from everything that we've done, partnerships, recognizing that no one entity can do this alone. Uh, we had Munataro and uh, NECT uh, on board, Girl Rising, all the partners. Uh, but one of the most significant uh, that came out of the Munataro, uh, which was just brewing at the time we were thinking about Munataro, is a partnership with HP. Uh, this partnership enables us to work with HP to accelerate digital equity for 150 million people by 2030. It is, um, where are we today? Uh, we're just very honored uh, that the Vice President of Nigeria, who couldn't make it in June, is finally here with us. And all the honored guests, the delegation that came along with him. Um, I just want to thank everybody uh, for being part of this journey, for your ongoing support. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to Dr. Masha, who has, uh, like Abby said earlier, we were joined in the hips um, about two years ago. And uh, I, I know what she means when she says that, uh, because we've been through a lot together. And, um, and then Dr. Masha happened to us, and uh, everything just blew up significantly. So Dr. Masha, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to give you this opportunity to take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Hakim, he says we look for trouble, but we look for good trouble. And it's always yielding fantastic and amazing fruit. Um, I happen to lead, I have the opportunity to lead a team that, um, amongst other things, we, we, we are to deliver on innovative, um, sustainable, and transformational educational systems, ecosystems in conflict context. So that is a wicked problem in and of itself. And we've been on this social experiment for a few years now, and then we met <laughs> unlikely allies through um, NCTIG. I got it for the first time ever. And then by extension, we met Hakim, One Million Teachers, and then Queens. Um, we've benefited directly from the One Million Teachers um, Queens University Partnership through the training of our own teachers at our center um, for our children who are 
coming out of conflict. And directly, that's one. By extension, the state government as well will be training up to 10,000 teachers with One Million Teachers Queen par Partnership from Munataru. But I think what's more fascinating to me beyond all of that and what collaboration looks like and what collaboration should look like, what no one person can do it alone. And we are all individual entities with our goals, our objectives, but we are aligned in those objectives and we don't have to lose our identities, but we can come together and each one, you know, leverage off each other, learn our way through solutions, which is what we've been doing. And um, through this partnership, we've also been, we're now with um, Queens, the um, Advanced Social Impact Fellowship. And what we're able to do now is we've been given a platform to be a thought leader in the space of solving complex problems. Because what came naturally to us in um, designing the interventions for the ecosystem in the Northeast, apparently is an emerging field of study. And so now we are in that position to share the good practices we're in the position to curate tools that can be used to solve problems, thereby accelerating learning and accelerating solving problems, real life problems, which sits at the heart of what Queens itself identifies with, which is solving problems that affect people within their communities by leveraging innovation, um, collaboration, intellectual curiosity. And um, so we are happy for this partnership. And I think that it just speaks to what can happen if we open our minds and try to solve problems in a very holistic manner, knowing that not one person can do it alone. And with that, I would like to invite His Excellency, the Nigerian High Commissioner to Canada, Ambassador Inka Ashifu. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, a very gracious host uh, at Queen's University, Dr. Terry Shira, the Provost and Vice Principal Academic, Dr. Sandra Den Otter, the Vice Provost International, Dr. Jane Philpot, the Dean Faculty of Health Sciences, other members of the faculty uh, in Queen's, other distinguished um, individuals here today, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think one of the things I'm required to do is to introduce the, the guest speaker for today. But before then, I'd like to just make one or two comments. I'd like to say how delighted we are to be in Kingston today. Um, I really had, would have preferred to have brought His Excellency to Kingston on the 1st of June for many obvious reasons. But I, I dare say better late than never. If you couldn't get summer, then spring will. I mean, if you couldn't get spring, then fall will do. So we're happy to be here today, and we've we've received a warm welcome, in spite of what the weather may be suggesting. So we're delighted. It's just. I'd like to say that um, as High Commissioner from Nigeria to Canada, one of my mandates is to explore areas of collaboration between Nigeria and Canada across a broad variety of of um, of, of sectors. And I think one of the areas in which we've seen the most fruit is the education space. There is collaboration between Nigeria and Canada in the education sector in ways and manners that are mutually beneficial and mutually rewarding. And we've seen all kinds of collaboration. We've seen curriculum enhancement. We've seen joint research products, exchange programs, programs whereby people are able to start a program in Nigeria and come and finish in Canada. It's getting better and better and deeper all the time. But I'd like to appreciate Queens because Queens actually acts. It's not about saying we will do. Queens actually has been doing. And we've been seeing collaboration time and time again. And it makes us very happy. We're not talking about what we hope will happen. We can talk about what has happened already. And then we can then dare to dream for bigger and loftier things. So I must appreciate Queens University and say how glad we are to, to be here today. And to say the future is bright. I'm happy, for instance, about the collaboration with Lagos Business School. That's very innovative. That's the kind of, we want, we need to see more of those things because that's how we really enhance each other and we become richer through collaboration. So thank you very much. I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our esteemed guest of honor and guest speaker. And um, by the time I'm done, I hope people will not say that maybe 
I'm flattering him because I hope to get a promotion of some sort because that is no, not in any way the truth. But everything I'm about to say about him can easily be verified. If I were to read his curriculum vitae, his resume, we might spend a lot of time here. I'd love to eat into the time of his own presentation, which would not be ideal. But I'd like to tell you a few things about the man himself, the man that I've come to know. Um, nobody will dispute the fact that he is a man of great integrity, a man of loyalty, and a man of uncommon un decency with a prodigious intellect. That cannot be disputed. As a minister of the gospel, he is a beacon of light and an inspirational figure. As a scholar and a lecturer of law, he is preeminent and the first among equals. The youngest have become a professor of law during his time at the age of 33. <laughs> <laughs> As a legal practitioner, he is highly accomplished and a towering figure, having won numerous landmark constitutional cases. He is the senior advocate of Nigeria, which you would call the Queen's Council in, in Canada. As a public servant, his most defining characteristic is a concern for the less fortunate. When he was the Attorney General of Lagos State and Commissioner for Justice, his major preoccupation was having getting access to legal support for those who could not afford it and those are legacy issues. As Vice President of Nigeria, he was the main architect of what may arguably be, have become the most ambitious and audacious social intervention program in Africa. It speaks for itself. He is a firm advocate of the principle of noblesse oblige, which simply says that those of us who are privileged have an obligation to care for the less fortunate. He lives by this rule. And one of his quotes, which I would like to put forward today, is that the path to greatness is self-sacrifice for the good of others. You'll only be great if you devote your life and efforts to serving others. That's what he lives by. Fairness and equity are important to him, and I believe this attribute will come through today when you listen to his lecture. He continues to approach the burning issues of our time with rigor, with diligence, with humility and great wisdom. Your Excellencies, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to respectfully invite forward Professor Yemi Oshibajo, <laughs> SAN, UCON. Please stay. Thank you very much. Please sit. Well, with an introduction like that, I better make sense here today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Very kind of you. Uh, let me begin by thanking our friends and colleagues here at the Queen's University for being such generous and gracious hosts. And uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Terry Shera, Provost and Vice Principal Academic, uh, Dr. Sandra Den Alta, Vice Provost International, Dr. Jane Philpott. Dean Faculty of Health Sciences and so many others who have made uh, our coming here today so worthwhile and who have been great collaborators and friends uh, as we've heard for years now and uh, especially in very, the very recent months. We've just had some conversations on some of the incredible work that Queens through uh, the Faculty of Education, the Center for Social Impact, and One Million Teachers uh, program is doing in Nigeria with various Nigerian entities, for which we are, of course, deeply grateful. And we're also excited about the prospects of deepening existing and future collaboration. And you've heard a lot of already about what has been done. And frankly, uh, it's just the tip of the iceberg. If you actually look at what uh, achievements have been made, is really, uh, is really quite uh, something to talk about. But uh, today I'm going to speak briefly on uh, another subject, uh, which is Africa and climate justice. Africa and climate justice. Perhaps one should begin really by uh, stating the obvious, which is that climate change is perhaps the most significant global existential threat today and will be so for a while to come. And the frightening signals are everywhere. Wildfires, unprecedented heat waves, massive floods, droughts, biodiversity loss, 
melting polar ice caps, desertification, rising water levels, and all of the disastrous socioeconomic implications and impacts of that. So the obvious, if, if difficult solution to the crisis is to stop carbon emissions and use green energy. The staple wisdom is that fossil fuels in particular are some of the worst pollutants. So that being the case, it is proposed that countries and corporations should quickly reduce these high pollutants and instead use renewable energy, such as solar, wind, uh, hydro, and uh, biofuels, and completely stop the use of these carbon emitters by the agreed dates, 2050, and for those um, for Nigeria and other countries, we say 2060, Nigeria says 2060, that's our target. But the second point, and this introduces what some describe as the energy conundrum, it is that developing countries, and especially Sub-Saharan Africa, there are two, not one existential threat. Aside from the climate crisis, we have the challenge of extreme poverty and its implications for disease, for malnutrition and premature mortality. Now, energy poverty or lack of access to energy is at the heart of poverty in Africa. So just as the world has made commitments to reduce global warming, the world has also agreed to 17 sustainable development goals that are built on the critical principle of leaving no one behind. In addition, sustainable development and poverty eradication are enshrined in the relevant global treaties, including the Paris agreements, that they, of course, the climate agreements. These considerations that I've mentioned are at the heart of what is loosely described as a just and equitable transition, or what some would describe as climate justice, perhaps more broadly. To elaborate on its contours, the notion of climate justice insists that in addition to discussions on greenhouse gas emissions and the need to reduce them, we also recognize that climate change is an inherently social issue with important social justice implications. So then we need to reframe our climate action paradigm from merely a technical effort to cut emissions to an approach that places people and addressing social inequality at the center of our efforts. So this is based on the reality that while climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe and no place on earth will be immune to its effects by and large, the impact will be different across regions and across groups. In particular, the poor and the vulnerable, largely in developing countries, will be the first to suffer, and of course are already the first to suffer, and the worst hit by the effects of climate change, even though they are the least culpable for the climate crisis. So the World Bank estimates, for instance, that high-income countries that are home to 14%, of the global population today are actually responsible for 44% of cumulative CO2 emissions. While Africa, at barely 3 to 4% of global emissions, contributes the least of any global region to emissions. So Africa is, by current estimates, despite the low contribution, warming faster than the global average and experiencing greater increases in sea level rise. The Sahel region which is a region which covers uh, plenty of most of North Africa and including Northern Nigeria, has recorded vegetation loss leading to a sharp rise in conflicts between farmers and herders. And I'm sure several, uh, perhaps Nigerians who are here will understand that because there are many conflicts between farmers and herders and that has led to dislocation of huge numbers of people in the north, uh, in the north of Nigeria, in the northwest, in the northeast, and even uh, in the north central of Nigeria. Southern Madagascar, for instance, is experiencing what the United Nations today describes as the world's first climate change induced farming. In Nigeria, we're currently also grappling with the catastrophic effects of floods that have affected 34 of our 36 states displacing over 1.4 million people and destroying over 100,000 hectares of farmland and causing close to 600 deaths today. 
The ADB, the African Development Bank, estimates that African economies are already between 5 to 15% smaller because of climate change. Besides, climate change as a threat multiplier is more evident in Africa than in any other region. Under a three degrees centigrade warming scenario, Africa is expected to lose up to 30% of current growing areas for maize and banana and 60% for beans by 2050, which would of course mean that many more Africans would suffer from hunger and famine. But the largest number of jobs in Africa being in the agricultural sector, reduced crop productivity will worsen unemployment gaps on the continent and resolve in grave socioeconomic consequences. Parallels of these multiply effects can be drawn in other sectors, health to shelter and security. But a prime example, and I want to just focus on this briefly, a prime example of the confluence of many of the themes that I've already highlighted is the global energy transition, the global energy transition. Energy consumed for electricity, for heat and transport is the largest single source of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, em emissions beg your pardon. This is over 70% of global emissions. So for electricity, heat, and you know, uh, transport, that is 70% of global emissions today. So reducing emissions from the energy sector is crucial for limiting warming to the 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, that is the target. But the energy sector is one of the starkest examples of global inequality. In 2020, Sub-Saharan Africa had about 52% of its population, that's 568 million people, without access to electricity. On the other hand, most developed countries, of course, have 100% energy access. Over 1.3 billion people in Africa are serviced by an installed capacity of 244 gigahertz of power which is less than the 248 gigahertz system for Germany's population of 83 million people. Sub-Saharan Africa remains the only region in which the number of people without access to clean cooking fuels and technologies is rising. 19 of the 20 countries with the lowest clean cooking access rates are in Africa. In practical terms, these energy deficits produce staggering effects. For instance, the clean cooking deficit leads to about 500 million premature deaths from household air pollution in Sub-Saharan Africa annually. Furthermore, gender inequities are exacerbated and millions of women and children suffer from critical health conditions. Again, due to the electricity deficits, half of secondary schools and a quarter of, half of health facilities in Sub-Saharan Africa have no power. In addition, Though Africa's current unmet energy needs are huge, future demand will even be greater as populations expand and people move into the middle class and rapid urbanization continues. Mitigation efforts such as electrification of heating, of cooking and transportation, as well as adaptation efforts like keeping people cool and safe in a warming climate will also require even more energy. So for many gas rich but energy poor countries in Africa, such as Nigeria, we recognize the role that natural gas being a much cleaner fossil fuel must play as a transition fuel in the short term to facilitate the establishment of base load energy capacity that's for industry and address clean cooking deficits in the form of LPG. But there has been, but there have been very strong resistance to this. Several global North nations have placed restrictions on the use of development funds for natural gas infrastructure in Africa, with ripple effects, of course, in the private financial sector. While the US and others have created some exceptions in their policies, the intended flexibility is not yet clear, and we have not seen most of that anyway in practice. But many of these same countries include gas as a major pillar of their multi-decade decarbonization strategies. And several others fired up uh, decommissioned coal plants in the wake of the Russian-induced energy crisis uh, this year. So clearly, limiting the development of domestic gas projects, which is a critical energy transition pathway for Africa, 
violates the enshrined principles of equity and justice and poses dire challenges for African nations while making an insignificant dent in global emissions. So even if we triple electricity consumption in African countries, aside from South Africa, that is, solely through the use of natural gas, this would add just 0.6% to global emissions. And just recently, an international energy agency study just this year shows that more than 5 trillion cubic meters of gas resources have been discovered to date, to date in Africa, which have not yet been approved for development. These resources, they say, could provide an additional 90 BCM of gas by 2030. And this will be vital, of course, for fertilizer, for steel, cement industries, and water desalination. Uh, desalination. But the cumulative CO2 emissions from the use of all of these gas resources over the next 30 years will be an additional 10 uh, gigatons. And if these emissions are added to Africa's cumulative total today, they will bring its share of global emissions to a mere 3.5%. The EU subregion alone does 8% today already. So the point that must be made is that it is unfair that while many global North countries recognize the need for a wide range of options and different pathways to net zero for themselves, the same courtesy is not necessarily extended to Africa. In terms of financing, the inequities are also striking. The International Energy Agency reports again that emerging and developing economies currently account for two thirds of the world's population, but only one fifth of global investments in clean energy. Africa, which is home to 18% of the global population, only receives barely 3% of global energy investment. So of the $2.8 trillion, that's US dollars, invested in renewable energy from 2000, that's the year 2000, to 2020, only about 2% of that, 60 billion US dollars, came to Africa. The IEA estimates that Africa needs $133 billion annually in clean energy investments to meet our energy, climate goals, energy and climate goals uh, between 2026 and 2030. That's, you know, uh, barely a four year period. However, annual investments in renewable energy stands at only $9.4 billion on the continent. Additionally, for African countries, the cost of finance and perceived investment risk remains significantly higher than for developed economies, despite the vast improvements in stability and governance. This affects all energy investments, but it is more critical in the case of renewables like solar, like wind, and battery storage, because these are all heavily weighted towards upfront capital expenditure. In all of this, I think that one should emphasize that developing economies have not shown themselves to seek a free pass when it comes to climate action. There is more than sufficient evidence of their commitment to developing climate sensitive, locally grounded transition pathways, as many of us have done with our NDCs, our national, development, our national uh, determined contributions. There are also regional initiatives like the Great Green Wall Initiative, which is an African initiative. The original vision was to create a wall of trees against desertification in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa across North Africa. But it has grown into a variety of sustainable land use practices designed to combat climate change and desertification and to address food insecurity and poverty. And recently, Nigeria launched our Energy Transition Plan, which outlines pathways to universal energy access by 2030 and net zero by 2060. And one of the programs identified to kickstart our uh, energy transition program is our flagship large-scale decentralized solar program. And we call it the Solar Power Niger Project, which seeks to electrify 5 million homes and 12, uh, 25 million people using solar home systems uh, and mini grids. And we estimate that it will create about 250,000 jobs in the process. So far, we've gone some ways with that. We're close to 500,000, but we think that that will be accelerated in the next year. 
The project builds on the successes from the Nigeria Electrification Project, which also seeks to increase access to electricity services in the country, and has so far provided over 1.7 million people with electricity access. So there's a lot of work going on in solar power in particular. We're not doing very much yet in wind, but there's a lot of work uh, in, in solar power. On the data side, the federal government, in partnership with uh, C4All uh, and Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, launched our integrated energy planning tool earlier this year. The tool is powered by extensive geospatial modeling and optimization, as well as the most recent data to provide actionable intelligence for planning the expansion of least cost access to electricity and clean cooking, and, uh, clean cooking in, the, in our nation. So as a global community, I, I think uh, it's important that we have to acknowledge the differences between groups in how they experience climate change and ensure that the process for making decisions about the impacts of and the responses to climate change are fair and they're transparent and determine how the costs and benefits of climate action will be equitably shared. And I think a big win for those of us who followed the proceedings in Egypt at COP27 was the loss and damage fund, which is to compensate poor countries for climate change related loss and damage. Although we're not at the point yet where we're sure of how the funds will come together or how for that matter, you'll determine who has suffered loss and damage and how uh, and whether it will be adequate for the purpose. But we're happy at least that we've made uh, progress uh, because the loss and damage fund at least was one that many of us uh, fought very hard for and were able to get it uh, at uh, COP27. So a just approach, uh, what would be just and fair to the global energy transition? should recognize in my view, at least the following. One is that developing economies must have universal access, universal energy access at levels sufficient for dignified livelihoods and economic growth. Two, that energy transition must place energy access for both consumptive and productive uses, as well as the required policy flexibility, financial and technical support at the heart of climate action that we cannot have climate action that does not take these issues into consideration. Three, that making capital available for the build out of energy systems is central to reaching the goals of the Paris agreements. And four, that to meet its decarbonization obligations, Africa needs both conventional and, uh, both conventional and development uh, and innovative mechanisms like death for climate investments, carbon trading, et cetera. By the way, there's a lot of work going on on uh, voluntary carbon markets. We're collaborating with several African countries and Colombia in trying to deepen our, our climate finance alternatives. And the, the voluntary, carbon voluntary carbon market is one of the very major initiatives, which uh, again was announced at COP27 and which we hope uh, will be a pathway for raising, not just raising uh, climate finance capital, but also for accelerating uh, decarbonization export, uh, efforts. And we heard today at our earlier meeting about some of the carbon capture uh, options that are being explored here at Queen's University. And we hope that we'll be able to benefit from all that effort. And five, that we must lift inhibitive development finance restrictions and upscale technology transfers to ensure that development regions have access to the latest energy innovations and can build local industries on fair terms. And finally, that the race to net zero must not leave Africa in the dark. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you.
extraordinarily powerful challenge to the global community to acknowledge differences in responses to climate change. I think we have a few minutes, perhaps, for um, some questions. Um, and uh, we'll have to keep this sort of brief because we're running a little behind schedule. But I'd invite to a question for you. I thank you, Your Excellency, and um, it's an honor to have you in our presence. My name is Loretta. I am an MBA student uh, here at Queen's University School of Business, and uh, in Nigeria, and left Nigeria years ago to Canada. But my question today, although I had a question about collaboration, but just in line with the topic of Africa and climate change, my question is. As we're challenging um, the global economy and other international bodies to help support and create a more um, de facto Africa and the decision making, how are we prepared to educate our people on how like these changes are coming? Are our people in Nigeria and Africa, do we have the infrastructure, the the funding and commitment to educate people on the importance of climate change? Because I see that. It's a topic that is out there, but a lot of Nigerians or Africans are not don't understand why this is important. And to implement this change, we need people that understand why this is important and why we need to have. So my question is, how are we investing in people and what are the commitments that African nations have in, in investing in people to understand the importance and the coming change that is going to happen be it Nigeria in 2016 or uh, the future. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm going to gather a few um, more. So I see a hand at the back, please. Hello. So my name is Tiko. We can't hear you very well. I wonder if I'm going to give you the mic. Hello, so my name is Victor Utokoro. I'm a PhD candidate in mechanical and materials engineering. So my research is on nuclear material. So my question to the vice president is, is there any plans to incorporate nuclear power, nuclear energy to the Nigerian energy mix in terms of trying to achieve net zero by 2050 or 2060? And because in Ontario currently we use about 60% of um, our energy from nuclear power and 15% is from 15% of Canada's energy is from nuclear power. So any plans of looking at nuclear power in terms of achieving our energy mix? Thank you. Thank you very much. Another question here. Hello, my name is Nifemi Adewye. I'm a second year health sciences student with a specialization in global and population health. Nifemi Adewye. Uh, <laughs> and so my question is directed to Mr. Hakim Sabir and you too as well, Dr. Miriam. Um, so what advice do you have for aspiring global health um, activists when we go through our lessons? We've talked about the SDGs. We've talked about sustainable development. It seems so daunting. There's so many barriers. So for us who are sort of early on in our careers and have this aspiration to make change globally and in our home countries, Nigeria, what advice do you have for us in making those strides and those steps? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, please. Um, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rutha Sinde. Um, I'm second year in psychology and health studies. And my question is about the plan for the youth. So with our step forward, Nigeria has such a huge population that is young. How do we plan on equipping our youth to deal with the way we're moving in the world, especially when we're looking at climate change and how we don't want to leave Africa behind? How do we not leave our youth specifically Nigerian youth behind while we do this. Okay, thank you. I think we have two more questions and we'll take it from here and then there and then we'll have a response, please. So. Hello, my name is Winifred Ireyi. I'm the chair of the Girl Force Movement where we provide coordinated advocacy for the girl child in Nigeria across the UN Sustainable Development Goals. My question is very similar to the question of the young lady here, and maybe the question about the youth. Um, when we're talking about um, climate change, Winifred Ireye, 
when we are a climate climate um, justice activist myself, so when we are talking about climate change, I'm really concerned about the informal sector. So we we can look at the youth where you can use education to um to to get them equipped to get them to know about um, climate change. But what about the informal sector? Those women, those small uh, small and medium sized um, businesses run by women. How do you get them informed about the importance of climate change so that they don't cut trees to make firewood and, mm -hmm. and, and, and contribute to the pollution? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's one last question here, and then we'll gather um, some responses. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. My name is Tenyan Otomagi. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Geography and Planning. And of course, my focus is really on women, entrepreneurs, and access to capital. Um, the VP uh, spoke Tinya, T-I-N-Y-A-N. I'm from Edo State, I'm Nigerian, but been living in Canada now for about 40 years. And my question really is about what you touched on in terms of women in agriculture. And of course, uh, a lot of them are, uh, we call it the inform informal sector. They're considered low income. They fall under the low income category. How are we actually in Nigeria going to tackle the issues that they will face? when some of these climate disasters start happening, because these are women they're in agriculture, but they shoulder the brunt of the problem. They shoulder, of course, making sure that their families are fed. And currently, a lot of the things that they produce stay within the informal sector. They don't really, you know, and then they stay under what we call the low income category. So I really would love you to touch on what is being done, or at least plans that are in place to address women in agriculture and what they will face when climate disasters sort of start to roll over. Thank you. Okay, and, and I missed a, a persistent hand right in front of me. I'm sorry about that. So this will be our last question before I turn to you, Your Excellency. My name is Reverend Cosmas Sajawara, a member of the Nigerian community here in Kingston. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for that wonderful presentation, especially for challenging the global uh, community when it comes to climate uh, change actions. I like to also, since you're already here, uh, to challenge the Nigerian uh, community as well and, and government in terms of our actions against climate change. It was in the news two days yesterday that we are drilling more oil in the Northeast. Isn't that counterproductive that we are talking about decarbonization and at the same time talking about drilling more oil? Thank you very much questions and would you like to come to the front to answer some of them? Thank you very much uh, everyone for the questions. Uh, I begin with Loretta um, who asked a question about how we're going to educate people on the importance of climate change. How do we uh, educate our people on the importance of climate change. I think uh, what has happened so far, aside from the fact that there are quite a few, you know, uh, sensitization um, programs that are going on, I think the effects of climate change themselves are beginning to show so starkly that there is no question at all that this is real. And there, there's no better education than what we're seeing today. Uh, for example, in previous years, we never had the kinds of flooding that we've had recently. In 2008 and 2012 were the worst floodings that we ever had. But now in 2022, we've had flooding in 34 of 36 states. So the case is much easier to make, you know, the case for saying we need to deal with climate change issues is much easier to make. But I want to emphasize the point, and this is really, and I think it goes to the question that was asked uh, by, uh, I think it was Winifred, who wanted to know about how to educate uh, smaller, medium uh, sized uh, businesses and you know uh, people about firewood, about not cutting trees for firewood and all that. I think the very important point that I, we should make is that first, the whole point of uh, climate justice, in my view, is to ensure that we who are the least emitters of 
carbon of carbon of uh, of CO2 should not have to pay the price that we're paying. So a lot of what we're seeing in Africa, a lot of the climate damage that we're seeing in Africa is of course not caused by emissions from Africa, which is really the point. That is, and that's the reality. So we are not contributing anywhere near the damage that we're seeing, which is the whole point of climate justice. And to the point about firewood and all of that, the reason why we are, why people are forced, forced to use firewood is because we have not, we are not using all of the clean cooking options that there are. The most effective clean cooking option is LPG, that's gas. It's the most effective, which we're trying to introduce. But if there are attempts to prevent the use of gas, and to your point, uh, Reverend Cosmas, you know, you cannot say that the resources that are that are in the Northeast should not be drilled. They must be drilled if we are going to get anywhere near close to the industrial activity that we need to prevent poverty. We absolutely must. If we are going to get people, if we are going to stop people from deforesting, cutting down trees for firewood, we absolutely must ensure that they have gas for clean cooking. So for us, the options uh, in, in, in Nigeria and in many parts of Africa, the options are obvious. We, and this is the point I was making, that even with all of the gas resources that we have, we are still minimal emitters of CO2. And if we do not use those options, we run the risk of driving our people further into poverty, which is really the, which is really the point. So I think that we must, while educating our people and balancing, we must ensure that we do not deprive ourselves of the resources that are required for, for advancement, for, for development. And, you know, we've, I've had several discussions, as you can imagine, with several uh, activists uh, in different parts of the world, especially, gov uh, especially governments all over the world and in the global north in particular, many of who uh, would like to see uh, reduced uh, use of gas and all of that and defunding gas projects and all that. But no one has yet been able to show any industrialized economy that has industrialized using renewable energy alone. That's, the, that's just the honest truth. So we need to have for base load for industry, for example, you absolutely need to have gas, which is still a cleaner fuel, at least as a transition fuel. So we cannot, we, we cannot say, I mean, we, we cannot say in, in our part of the world, that, oh, we're going to ignore the gas, uh, gas resources. We cannot, nobody is ignoring their gas resources. As a matter of fact, uh, as soon as trouble came from Russia uh, in the Ukraine, uh, the, the problems in Ukraine, many of the countries that said they had commissioned their, their coal plants fired them up immediately. And coal, of course, as you know, is the worst of the, you know, of the, uh, of the pollutants. So I think that we need to balance. We, we need to, and which is the point we're making. We need to have that balance. We need to understand that balance. Otherwise, in a bid to meet uh, climate change obligations, Africa will not only shortchange itself, but shortchange its people and deepen the poverty that, that, that we already experience. So I think that that's the, uh, the, the point I'd like to make about uh, what to do about educating our people. We have, the, the, it's not just educating about um, not cutting trees. It's really more about providing LPG, providing the alternative. And we need to provide uh, that alternative. There are many programs now. Um, for instance, in Nigeria, we have a very major program on expanding the use of LPG, clean cooking. And then we also have some solar park uh, stoves. So we have uh, clean cooking stoves using gas, some using solar power. And that, you know, those are some of the initiatives around trying to prevent uh, people from cutting trees and deforesting. Um, Victor wanted to know about uh, what we're doing about nuclear, using nuclear materials for uh, energy. And that's an interesting point because we have a nuclear regulatory authority, Nigerian Nuclear Regulatory Authority. And part of the work that that has been doing is trying to see how we can actually use nuclear power safely for, you know, uh, nuclear energy safely for, for power. Now, we have already proposals uh, from 
two countries about assisting us with the use of nuclear reactors, small, um, very, very small uh, nuclear devices that we can use, portable. Some of them are actually portable that we can use for power and all of that. Of course, there are many, many concerns around safety and, and, and those sorts of things. But some of these have been in use for years and years and years in other parts of the world. And we think that we can actually, uh, we think we can actually use them. So uh, the Nigerian Nuclear Regulatory Authority is already in full discussions on the use of this option. And I think that is something that we really should take quite seriously because at least it is uh, clean. In, in that, um, it, uh, as one of the options that we have for clean energy. Uh, Nif Femi wanted to know about what advice for activists in SDG implementation. I think that really, there's a, a lot of work has to be done. And um, frankly, it is just getting in there, just diving in there and doing as much as you can. Uh, and I think uh, to the point uh, that, uh, to that point, um, Hakim, the One Million Teachers Initiative, uh, said that um, really to start anything on the scale that is required, you really just mustn't allow fear to, to overtake your efforts. I mean, there are the, the challenges are huge and um, whatever it is you choose to do, there's more than enough to do. But I think that you'll be surprised how very quickly you'll get support, how very quickly you'll find those who are prepared to assist. And I think that really is, it is starting out and uh, taking perhaps one area, you know, that one can focus on and do some really interesting work. So for me, I think really it's more, you know, I, I, it is endless, frankly, but uh, the more of it you do, I think the better uh, for the world and um, the better for all of the other efforts that are being made. Uh, huge population, I think uh, there was a question on how, where, how not to leave young people behind. Uh, in, I, I, I'm not so sure whether this is necessarily tied to climate change, but I think the important thing is that a lot of the focus, a lot of our attention in Nigeria is invariably focused on young people because we have uh, a massive, uh, I mean, we have a massive population of young people. Well over 60% of our population will be described as young. In fact, some would say 65% of our population. So everything is focused and has to be focused around young people. Education has been focused around young people. And, and again, the, the, the issue really is one of scale. Everything, and we were talking earlier today about that, you know, and that everything we're trying to do in, in Nigeria, we have a huge population, 216 million people, increasing by 6 million every year. You know, that's a, in some places a whole country, you know. So every year you have 6 million additional people, additional young people. So we really have to think on, uh, you know, at scale and how to do things at scale, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, whether it's innovation, whether it's technology, it has to be at scale. And I think that what we're doing, what, what we're managing to achieve quite well is collaborations, working with different people, Queen's University, for example, we're doing quite a bit of work with them. Collaboration is key. There's no way that we can resolve all of those problems on our own. All of the policies are there, very you know, great policies are there. But implementing these policies requires, of course, you know, large uh, resources and, and of course, innovation and all of that. But um, I think that with the kinds of very active collaboration that we're seeking all over the world and people we're working with in different parts of the world, uh, we will uh, certainly be able to achieve uh, most of those objectives. I think uh, I've taken Winifred's question. Uh, Tinia wanted to know about women and culture and what they will face. Uh, well, I think the the, I, I've taken some of that already in the quest, in answering the questions on deforestation and all that. But generally speaking, uh, obviously women in, in practically any aspect of uh, the economy are disadvantaged. And I think that in agriculture, perhaps even more so, because agriculture again constitutes, you know, uh, the largest, uh, pool of uh, um, uh, the, the largest bit of employment or opportunities for employment that we have. And 
what we've tried to do with agriculture generally and investments in agriculture is also to target women in some of the efforts that we're making. So in the Food for Jobs program, which is part of our, what we call our economic sustainability plan, we targeted female, uh, ag uh, female farmers in particular. So uh, giving uh, resources, inputs, improved seedlings, uh, fertilizer and support, we try to target uh, 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 women in agriculture. But again, the, the, the real issue is, for us is improving the whole value chain because there's a lot of subsistence agriculture, but we're trying to do a bit more than that. We're trying to move into really just improving the entire value chain because for most people who are in agriculture in the rural communities, it's not enough. These are not good paying jobs. And unless there is some value addition, they're not likely to become better empowered, they're not likely to be wealthier and able to achieve you know, their own uh, objectives in life and all that. So a lot of the effort now is on trying to ensure that, aside from storage issues, which we're dealing with, but trying to ensure that we add value to the entire chain. So those who are involved in subsistence agriculture are also involved in value addition in one way or the other. And that we think will quickly improve uh, the lot of those who uh, uh, the lot of farmers. Uh, I think those are the questions. I've already taken the question on drilling more oil. I think those are the main questions. Uh, you know, I think uh, those are the questions. Those are the main questions. But uh, just to say, I don't know how many people here play football. How many? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just wish you all, especially Canada, a good, uh, good luck with, with Belgium. <laughs> Of course, those of us who are football enthusiasts are forever monitoring uh, football. But I wish you a very good luck. Uh, and since Nigeria isn't playing, well, I mean, <laughs> back, we'll just back Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've rightly judged where we're all going at 2 p.m. this afternoon. But um, thank you for being so um, extraordinarily generous with your time um, and with your thoughtful comments for really challenging us to think about um, the inequities of the energy transfer pathways that you've laid out for the differential impact, socioeconomic impact in different parts of the world on climate change. And it's not only that you've given us a lot to think about, but also to act upon. And so I appreciate that call to collaborative action, to partnership, which we've seen featured today, but have so much scope um, to build upon. And uh, we want to really build on the momentum of your visit. Um, so we are planning um, a panel event in the coming months um, uh, on uh, work in um, West Africa. And we'll be calling on members that are here today and also members of the uh, community here in Kingston to join us on that event. We'll be sending out information, but also to look at the the Twitter feed for Queen's International, Queen's Global. So um, thank you again to all the thoughtful questions from the floor and to the very thoughtful answers and comments that we heard from you, um, Your Excellency, this afternoon. Thanks all for coming. <laughs>